Oh, it's Wednesday, and what have we just witnessed? Arsenal's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad week continues. Turned over in Munich, 1-0. Oh, ain't, ain't. And um, we have long said they have had more chance of winning the Champions League than the Premier League title. Oh, this is the week that we learnt they might not win either. Uh, hang that one in the Tottenham Trophy cabinet. Uh, in Manchester, Real Madrid played Atletico Madrid, styly, holding on for uh, and taking Manchester City to penalties and clipping them there. This is honestly like seeing Omar uh, get clipped in the wire. Honestly, I am shocked. I am shook. Um, Real Madrid, congratulations into the semi-finals for the 12th time in 14 years. Well played, Mr. Carlo. I still love you. Oh, we'll unpack it all. We'll do it live. We'll take your questions. And I'm not here alone. I'm delighted to say, live from London, oh, minutes before he heads to Atalanta tomorrow morning, it's the king of Syria for the Athletic, the pride of Hull. Oh, it's Mr. James <laughs> Horncastle. That's right. The perfect guy to bring on for a Champions League quarterfinal night with no City A representatives whatsoever. Well, the big question <laughs> is, James Horncastle, is the Premier League, I don't like to be knee-jerk, is it over? Rog, we're all buying stock in the Bundesliga. The Bundesliga is so back. We yes. are so back. Right so now. back. So hot right now. I mean, it is, it is a madness. Um, I think only Wrexham can save... Uh, English football right now, and they're not even English. James, it is great to see you. Tell the people before we dive in and analyse both of these games, what time you are getting up tomorrow to get yourself to Bergamo to watch Liverpool's Remontada. <laughs> or, as they say in Italian, Remonta. Such a different language. Yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I can't speak either, but just tell us. Your commitment is, is unreal. What time is your flight? Okay. So the, the clock here in the UK is about to tick uh, 2300 and I will be up at 3.15 for my flight to go to we'll, Bergamo. We'll get you out of here by 2.30. Oh, just a couple <laughs> of clicks. We love your commitment. We love your insight. And we're not here alone. This is a do it live, which means you, dear GFOPs, can be part of the show. You can ask your questions about football, about life. Oh, here's how you do it. Scan the QR code in the top left of your screen. It'll take you into a Zoom with our producer, J-Dubs. We'll get you I'll set up now. for your question. Come be with us. It's audio only. You don't have to put your shirt on. Um, but get in line now. Ask us anything. Arsenal fans, we feel your pain. Oh, Manchester City fans, do you even know how to feel in this whole new world? Tonight, you tasted a few of Everton's bitter tears. Um, and if you question or comment, Conway, get in the chat where we'll be reading through the show. Come be with us. I want to start with a toast very quickly, raising my third first Michelob Ultra of the day uh, or something like that to my friend, the quite magical Tariq Panja of the New York Times. He tweeted something which I loved. Um, he captured the football magic of last weekend. Uh, he wrote, great week to highlight why the football pyramid matters. Atalanta showing up at Anfield and trouncing Liverpool. Atletico Bilbao winning a major trophy for the first time in 40 years. Leverkusen winning the Bundesliga of a stunning unbeaten so far season. Huge, beautiful celebrations. None of them invited to the Super League. Godspeed. Oh, and up the bloody toffees. Um, into the action from Champions League quarterfinals. James, oh, our cup really overfloweth. Let's start in Munich. Bayern 1, Arsenal 0, Bayern progress 3-2 on aggregate. A, just a, a, a stiff kick to the down belows of all young romantic and dreamers. <laughs> Arsenal, oh, the babies, they entered a weekend uh, after that agony against Villa. That familiar sinking feeling stench. These two teams kicked off last week. It was just a completely different, more innocent world. Now they had to prove themselves to themselves, Arsenal, as much as anything. This is a game, many in the English press, there was one who wrote, this could be the defining night of Mikel Arteta's era so far. Really a battle between Arsenal's undoubted talent, Bayern's historic lineage. Um, just, oh, honestly, thinking about 
the 17th minute last week, Arsenal already 1-0 ahead in that first leg. I think of like Tracy Chapman talking about driving, driving their car, speed so fast, felt like I was drunk. Those were the good old days. Oh, but no, no. Suddenly Mikel Arteta had to urge his players to respond with, quote, character and leadership. Smoke-filled pitch. Um, you know, they had plenty of possession at the beginning, attempting to enforce their will, but it was Bayern. We were told, James, Bayern were porous, that they were that they were dilapidated, they were depleted um, through injury and suspension. But they seemed in the early exchanges far from it. They soaked up that Arsenal rhythm, strode forward with real purpose in those early exchanges. That's right, Rog. Like, this was supposed to be decadent Bayern, sort of end of empire Bayern, sort of Bayern raided by the Visigoths. <laughs> and instead, I don't know, you know, maybe they'd had a few Michelobs like you, you know, over the last couple of hours, and they just thought, you know what, it comes down to this, we can make it happen. I saw Thomas Tuchel in, in one of his classic sort of gilets being told after the game, you're the first German coach, I think, to get to three... Champions League semi-finals with three different clubs, and he was like, and he didn't even look astonished at that. He was like, "Ah, it's good, you know, a man who knows his own worth, man who knows he's been there, done it before." And maybe that was the difference tonight. You know, Mikel Arteta pointing out, "Look, you haven't been in the Champions League for seven years." People in the English press, you mentioned them, Rog, saying this is a defining night. Um, but I don't think it is a defining night. You know, ultimately, this is part of a gradual journey that Arsenal are on. I think what has made people appreciate Arsenal over the last few years is they have not been knee-jerk, they've been patient, they've trusted the process and all those sort of things. And this is just a natural first step. This is a natural step in all of that. You, you, um, and you're, you're such a beautiful man. You're an optimistic man. You're a rational man. You're an open-hearted man. Arsenal have been all those things. Arsenal fans, I mean, this is the interesting thing. You know, football is emotional. It is non-rational. Um, and this is the, the reality of this moment. Whether, I mean, we'll, we'll get to the responses um, at the final whistle. Let's break down some of the moments together, James. Because, you know, at the outset, Kimmich, Sané, set up Harry Kane very early, twice, for what felt like terrifying warning shots. Uh, that dude to Arsenal, honestly, he's like Samuel Tarly. Uh, armed with dragon glass to White Walkers. Um, I mean, he just seems to live to hurt the Arsenal. Um, Fifth place Champions League coefficient coming down to England and Germany. This was the subtext of the night. Spurs looking like they could maybe need fifth. You know, I've got to just take a quick diversion here. I'm going to be candid. I was somewhat surprised. So many Spurs fans, almost to a, you know, almost to a uh, human being, 100% here, Rooting for Arsenal's defeat, GFOP at the one Macano. Um, we asked, What do you want to happen here? He said, Routine Harry Kane hat trick and dire, dirty sliding uh, into Saka. I've got to say, James, I am like, I, I approach life like I weigh up the joy of my own character's journey against my mm. rival's misery. I want that joy. Yeah. I do want that joy. There's an old saying, though, from Steve Coogan that we've mentioned a couple of times on this show. Steve Coogan once said, if you give your average English person the choice between his or her own success and your failure, they'll choose your failure every time. Do you subscribe to that philosophy, Jimmy Horncastle? Can you even put, um, you know, it's almost like hacking off your own arm if it hurts my enemy more. Can you put this into your own words so that we fully understand that? Because it is amazing. So I don't subscribe to it personally, but I've witnessed this uh, on a daily basis. And I just love the idea that Harry Kane, you know, who over the last week has had to put up with so many people saying, ha, Kane, he goes to the Bundesliga where Bayern have won it 11 years in a row and they can't win it this year. But maybe, as you just mentioned, Kane has been playing 4D chess all along. And really, he judges his season by getting Spurs into the Champions League still and making sure that coefficient, that fifth place, maybe something that can happen. I don't know. But, like, you know, I, I think the, the interesting thing with all of this is, is Bayern, uh, yeah, to look at them, you would, you would say it, 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 they have been reduced to looking like a small club and playing like a small club over these two legs, right? 
you know, they've sat back, they've been pretty humble. They've said, you know, let's let's counterattack. Let's almost play sort of Italian style, soak up all of this pressure. And even at home. Even at home. And you know what? There's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. I think in modern football we're we're taught to be ashamed of uh, of sitting your in your own penalty area, hoofing it and looking for an opportunity on the counter in that, rather than playing all of this clever positional, relational stuff. You know, I think modern football now is really about which words you can get into the dictionary rather than winning <laughs> games. And, and, and ultimately, Bayern Madrid is still very much like, no, it's about winning. It's not about, it's not about getting relationism into the, into the dictionary. Let's just, <laughs> let's just go and win, baby. Al Davis style. We did have flickers of Arsenal's edge. I think this may be the agony for Arsenal fans. There was an Erdegaard master blaster, Havertz who on a one-on-one. Martinelli probably would want that side foot for mid-range back, hit it right into Neuer's grateful tummy. Um, It was as if Arsenal knew uh, they needed a goal desperately to counter Harry Kane's inevitable incoming. Um, It was very cagey. Um, There's no doubt Arsenal had the quality edge. Um... But the longer the game went on, it felt like Arsenal were the better team here. But Bayern were most certainly the more dangerous. Mostly because, and this is something I need you to explain to us. Um, you know, Pep Guardiola talked about this in the years before City finally won a, uh, a Champions League. He said, we haven't had the experience of winning the Champions League, so we can't win it. Which is just a madness to me. You've never done it before, <laughs> so you can't do it. I'm like, so how do you do it? I don't know. Um, and there is a reality in this. This is the greatest tangible intangible. Bayern had an edge uh, because they have played many great European nights in the past. This was almost a, a, a squad of virgin uh, Arsenal um, outfit here. And the Germans had that experience at this level, at this stage. It oddly counts for so much. I don't fully understand it because it's about chemistry. It's about culture. It's about having been there before. Football people, they know this, but you could almost see it in these exchanges. It was almost palpable. Yeah, and it is so strange. And this is why we keep coming back to football because whenever you do your bracket or whenever you discuss who your favourites are, it's, it feels just so easy, so predictable to just say, Man City, not a treble. Uh, and <laughs> yet, nights like tonight throw up something like this. And it is unquantifiable, this, this, this kind of heft of history, which seems to be so overbearing. Uh, and it's not like Arsenal are some jolly-come-lately club that is some like artificial construct that has been created by the producers of Ted Lasso and all of a sudden they're playing Champions League. It's like, this is Arsenal. They have played in a Champions League final before in 2006. Okay, none of these players, none of this coaching staff, none of these owners even, but... That doesn't seem to matter to sort of Bayern. <laughs> it doesn't seem to matter to, to Real Madrid. <laughs> you know, ultimately, it, it, it feels like... Can you imagine, like, a transfer strategy meeting, Rog, in, in sort of early June? And you're thinking, like, OK, we've got some gaps at left back. We could maybe do with a number 10. But you know what? We've got history. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, I know. So why, 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 do we have we, to, why do we why, even need them? <laughs> We've been there before. We... We've been there before. <laughs> so we'll get there again. It is such a We've... circular argument. But in these yeah. moments, you can see it. By the way, I love that notion that Arsenal are like Richmond Day FC and they just, in that halftime locker room, they're just like, football is life. That can only get you so far. Um, it is crazy, though. The only way the Arsenal babies could gain these experiences is by having these experiences, if you know what I mean. Um, mm. I mean, it, it, it really was a game that for long periods it felt like both teams feared what could be lost rather than, uh, rather than that could be won and you know, fortune would favour the bold. Second half began with an exclamation point, 47th minute, a floated ball met by Goretzka with a death flicked header crashed off the post. Um, the magnificent Guerrero lashed a rebound from an acute angle off Ben White and onto the aforementioned same post, a moment which honestly seemed to sting um, the deepest part of the Arsenal collective psyche. Um, because for longer than that post reverberated, um, it was a reminder that risk could be punished. It felt like a gnawing seed had been sowed into 
uh, the whole team. You know, that confident tempo of old that we love. It's been thrilling to watch that Arsenal team. And by old, yeah. I mean before last week. Uh, just a fraction off. And that fraction was crucial. You could feel the doubt seeping in. It wasn't paralyzing, but it gave us an Arsenal that was strangely skittish, risk averse. There's a German word, um, Zugzwang, which is a feeling you have when you're losing at chess and you've got to move, but you know every move is going to put you into danger and that dominates your psyche. That's Zugzwang. And God, James, Arsenal second half, it was a bloody lot of Zugzwang. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, <laughs> all I've got in my mind now is that reverberating post as though it's like uh, like uh, one of those bells in a Tibetan monastery. Yes, a Zen uh, string, just reverberating. It, and it's and, and Arsenal are confronted by the Tibetan Book of the Dead. <laughs> they're just they're there and they can see, even though they've got 45 minutes still to go, that no... This this is their destiny. This is Ben their, White. This is their fate. You are the new Dalai Lama. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, look. I mean, one of the things that I was surprised by with Arsenal in in, in both of these games is is how difficult they found it to sort of penetrate the the Bayern penalty area. Um, even though Bayern like have this sort of Rubik's cube attitude to centre backs, they're like, ah, we spent like seventy million on Upa Meccano, um, <laughs> seventy million on Matthias De Ligt, and we've got we've got Dyer here, Eric Dyer now, and uh, what what do we do? Kim, Kim, and they don't know how it works, and yet seemingly in these two games, it's it's functioned, and you know Arsenal, I think it what three of their four Champions League knockout games have failed to score. And, and you know, this is a team that is used to scoring goals as much as people have liked to have this sort of narrative about don't Arsenal need an Erling Haaland guy type? The guy, the guy who doesn't score in Champions League games, by the way, in Champions League knockout games. And, um, and it, it's gone again. That's exactly from the what they need. Yeah, that guy. Can't <laughs> score. Team, We've got the team, the team here. That, the, the team that doesn't concede goals in the Premier League in 2024, they only concede four and now, in the Premier League. And, and now all of a sudden they've scored, they've conceded three in these two legs against ag- Bayern. It's an agony. It is. And I love your, yeah. your analysis that they spent 70 million on Upe Macaulay, 70 million on De Ligt, and then seven on, uh, on, on Dyer. And you're like, what? You mean 17, you mean seven million? Nope, just seven. Seven dollars. Yeah. That's what we said. To we, Dyer. We, we, we brought him to keep Harry Kane company. Yes, no. yes. It's like it's like when Everton got a Chinese player in the 1980s, Lee Tai. We signed another one, his best mate, just to kind of have so we could have someone to hang out with. That is Eric Dyer. But he was playing in this game and he was thriving. Yeah. And so it came to pass. I love your Tibetan Book of the Dead idea. Ultimately, it wasn't tactics tonight. Your point is Arsenal were undone by thinking about deep theological thoughts mid-game because 63rd minute. Just a period of confident, dangerous possession uh, for Bayern. Climaxing in Guerrero, looking up, seeing the hard-charging Kimmich, set him up for a header. Um, it was like a put-back dunk um, into the corner of the net. Arsenal's worst fears made real. Uh, felt painful uh, in itself. Uh, felt even more painful, I think, in context of this last eight days. This brilliant young team. Uh, second year on the run, daring to dream. Um, you know, having living out in public, big ideas, big concepts, big romantic notions, and then having it, all of it just turn to ashes in their mouth for the second time in a week. Eric Dyer, honestly, like the Johnny drama to Harry Kane's Vinnie Chase. It was hard to watch. It really was. I mean, apart, unless you Tottenham fans, it was hard to watch for neutrals in that moment, James Horncastle. Yeah, it is. Particularly, you have this uh, concatenation of just disappointment. You know, like it's it, it's like the guy who I don't know gets the job promotion that he always wants. He can see everything. You know, all of his life ambition is just there before him to be taken. And he steps out of work one day, and he seems to get mugged, and then he just loses his confidence, and he's just sort of like, and then he walks home as though he's. Yeah, the world's just turned against him. It's like um, a, that Michael Douglas film. 
uh, where he just turns into a rage monster. Is that Arteta's future? Yeah. Well, falling down. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. If you see Mikel Arteta in a fast food joint over the next few days, walk away. Okay. Mikel Douglas. <laughs> Mikel Douglas. <laughs> Meet Mikel Arteta. Honestly, Tottenham fans, the joy I believe this gave you might be as close as Tottenham Hots get to winning the Champions League um, in the next and, years. And Rog, like... Ange Postecoglou has kept saying, like, he's not interested in the Champions League. <laughs> All the journalists here, they keep asking him, but isn't it about top four? And he's like, no, I'm about personal development and growth. But he's really about this. Yes. He's really about moments like this. <laughs> It is. And, <laughs> and the ellipsis of that was not interested in us getting in the Champions League. I'm just interested in Arsenal getting in <laughs> shit in the bed. Yes, am I right, lads? I mean, God, it is. It, it is remarkable. And he, uh, this was even more. Even as the, the the English coefficient, the Champions League coefficient, took a massive ding. Um, yeah. Honestly, it could have been two 0 almost immediately. But Sane, I think it was, blazed over and Arsenal flung on Enketia for Tommy Asu, a forced wrist, looked eerily like the Arsenal of last year. Arteta himself, was it last year or the year before he talked about the concept, the Spanish concept of pajada in cycling? Uh -huh. um, that word he said that we use in Spain in cycling when a cyclist is going up a mountain, looks amazing, um, and in one kilometre, he just feels thud. He looks like he's stuck. It's just a word, pajada. I think marathon runners call it the wall. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's also awesome, yeah. weird. <laughs> yeah. But also, in, in, in English, in American cycling, this is called bonking, which again, like, okay. So. That's a different Michael Douglas movie. <laughs> that's yeah. nine that's and a half disclosure. weeks, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Sorry, fake you disclosure with Demi Moore? I think, it, but it is. <laughs> it's very much. Um, yeah, when I first heard that in the cycling context, I was like, wow, that's not what it means where I'm from. So, yeah, I will go with the Mikel Arteta Spanish version. Um, I think that has happened. And it's hap it happened the same this time last year with Arsenal. That's the thing. Like it, It's the mind uh, and the muscles just suddenly disconnecting. Um, you're flailing mm. down to the death. By the way, that corner at the death, that was bonking. I think everyone said that. They shouted at Saki, you're bonking, lad. You're bonking. <laughs> Um, you know, das ist bonking. <laughs> yeah, oh, he's bonking. The little man is bonking. Oh, I, I, I just think down to that death, there was a corner. And Saka, such a talent-soaked human wonder, yeah. couldn't even beat the first man. Unable to, as much as put it on Eric Dyer's head for the guaranteed own goal, couldn't even make that happen. Um, your man Tuchel, a bullion at the final whistle. His Bayern, mm. their season lost. Uh, but now refound. Um, but poor Arsenal. I don't know how you feel, James Horncast. You can be honest. For me, it's an agony. You know, as you said, they conceded, I think, four goals in their previous 11 Premier League matches before the Villa game. But now all comps, four goals in their last three games. Um, yeah. Huge amount of agony uh, on the field. A lot of sadness expressed as anger from some section of the, the Arsenal fan base. I honestly... Is that, is that Arsenal fan TV you're referring to? I don't... It, it's, just, it's, like, it's, it's, it's Morgan-esque. I don't like to... You know, it is. It's like... there's an It's just an entitlement. And I, I honestly still see this band as just a delirious group of guys on a hero's journey, capable of mm. summoning football that can make you feel alive when you watch it. A feeling now, though, the echo of last season... Um, ending not with a glory third, but with a whimper. Do you hear that again, James Horncastle? And how do you handicap? Like, I've got to say, as an Everton fan, bite your arm off to have Arsenal's agonies. I would bite your arm off to have these joys, these players, this talent, this wonder, this wonderfully maniacal, beautiful uh, manager. Um, but you know they will be, I, they will be battered and the choking the choking uh, label will be flung upon them again. Where are you, James? Give us some wisdom. Yeah, I mean in, in Italy they they have this term called braccino corto, okay, which is it, it's a tennis term, which is like Does when someone is is it bonking? <laughs> <laughs> well, something. No, I'm not going to go there. Braccino corto is when you have a match point in tennis. And it's there. The slam is there for you. You can imagine just picking up that Wimbledon salad bowl 
And instead, all of a sudden, your arm shrivels and it becomes short. So that's what it means. Braccino corto means literally you get the short arm, okay? And, and then you can't, you can't convert the match points. And that happened, obviously, last year when Arsenal were on top of the Premier League for more match days than anybody else. This year, they've got themselves, they've gone again. They've got themselves in the position to win the title again. And all of a sudden, Liverpool sit and, and Arsenal slip up and all of a sudden City are back in the driving seat. So, it, you know, but when this slam comes, to go back to tennis, when this slam comes, <laughs> it's going to be amazing, isn't it? Like, I mean, now that, that's, that's, that's what Arsenal fans have got to hold on for. It's, it, it, it's got to be more meaningful. For, for all of these moments that we're talking about tonight, the pain, the disappointment, the sadness, that have experienced this, that when the joy, the euphoria comes, think about that. Think like, about you know, it. it will, think you know, about it. Think about the bonking. The... Think about the short arm. You remember the short arm. You'll be like, lads, do you remember the days of the short arm? Um, don't look be at angry. our arms now. Yeah, look at them now. Don't be angry. Don't be angry, Arsenal fans. Listen to me. Just just prepare to be disappointed because mm. you're never disappointed to be prepared. By the way, I did love this tweet from my friend John Green over the weekend. My title preferences, according to the great novelist John Green, number one, Liverpool. He is a Liverpool fan. So number one, <laughs> Liverpool. Number two, Arsenal. Number three, season cancelled. Number four, literal apocalypse. Number five, Manchester City, which brings us to Manchester City, who played Real Madrid tonight, 1-1 at full-time, 4-4 on aggregate. And this is still shocking to me to even contemplate and put out into the world. The game won by Real Madrid, 4-3 on penalties. Um, City-Real Madrid, a game which, in the words of former Real coach Jorge Valdano, has become the modern Classico. An epic clash, I don't like to be hyperbolic, but of civilizations upon which the future of democracy depended. Last two champions colliding, storylines on top of storylines. England, young wonders, Phil Foden going up against Jude Bellingham. City charging in after last week's uh, Arsenal and Liverpool three-horse title race claps. Uh, that was all a bit like in The Empire Strikes Back where Han Solo's been frozen in carbonite. Luke's lost a hand, learns his father is the Dark Lord of the Sith. Now Skywalker's dangling at the bottom of Cloud City from an antenna. You with me, James Horncastle? Isn't that what it felt like before this? It did. I mean, do you think this was the most important event in in 2024? You know, a lot of people talk about uh, the November election over yep. stateside. You know, yep. you, but you 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 think you think the world hinged on this? You know, um, I think probably I'd put them that uh, there was this. And then there was Caitlin Clark and the WNBA draft. And then yeah. probably the, the election in November, upon which maybe the future of democracy and civilization does. But I put that as a probably number three, um, mm. which will be pushed down to number four if Everton escape relegation. But City did feel like champions elect going into this one. Um, Pep said, oh, but we are always far away from our dreams. Um, <laughs> before kickoff, we always thinking about Julia Roberts, that man. Into this one. Big news for City, Carl Walker back. First time since doing a hammy during England's game uh, three weeks ago against Brazil. I actually spoke to Ruben Diaz, was it two weeks ago? And I said, what do you think about when a ball is lobbed over your head in behind? And, and we joked that he just like thinks, Kyle's got it. Um, so Carl's return was meant to erase the one vulnerability that City had. Um, but as soon as Madrid played their first long ball, Jude Bellingham brought it down with the tender touch of an experienced lover. It was a touch as smooth as Sean Dyche's crown. Um, Vinny Jr. last in across, and it was Walker who slipped like some kind of English van der Ven, leaving Rodrigo wide open. He shinned the ball against Edison and then lashed it home with a second stab. Fourth goal against City for that man. And James, I mean, you look at football globally far more than I do. I'm a parochial human being. Such is City's imperiousness and seeming inevitability and invincibility. It was it was remarkable to see Edison beaten and City gobsmacked in that moment. It really was because all of the talk here was okay, but when City play Real Madrid at the Etihad, it'll be four 0 again, won't it? Just like last year, when City put in probably their defining statement performance 
of the Pep Guardiola era. It didn't get any better than that. Even when they went on and played in the semi-final and then they played in the final against Inter, they didn't replicate the performance that they put in against Real Madrid at the Etihad. So that was very much the expectation that they would just roll back the clock and just rinse repeat with that. And look, they dominated tonight. I think they had like 783 shots. They had 99.5% possession. And yet, history... <laughs> Carl Ancelotti was able to, 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 to line up history and all of the ghosts of Juanito, Zidane, you know, Alfredo Di Stefano. And, uh, and those guys are, are still pretty good. Uh, a bit rusty, <laughs> but they're, they're, they're still pretty good. And, um, and, and it happens. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, I, I, I think me going into this game, um, not that I was playing, but the, what, what I was thinking was Madrid had kind of blown it in the first leg in that they'd had nine days to prepare. You know, like La Liga basically said, guys, you go off on holiday whilst we do the Copa del Rey final. It's fine. Oh, you know, three of our teams are in Champions League semifinals. Just a coincidence. But yeah, go and have a break. Uh, and then you had the fact that Walker wasn't playing in that first leg. De Bruyne gets ill. Um, and Carlo, good old avuncular Carlo, who is always sort of underestimated, um, I, I think, you know, sort of in the, certainly in the English media, in terms of like, he's the old guy sat at the bar who basically, you know, you're playing pool and you think you're cleaning up at pool and then basically you you kind of goad this this old man into a game and he basically comes and, and cleans up and that's that's what color does i mean like in the first first leg nice little bit of tactical tweakery playing rodrigo on the left hand side vinicius no one was expecting that what's going on carlo wow the guy does actually study film he doesn't just you know smoke cigars and you know go into this great restaurant <laughs> <laughs> well maybe his son does Davide who's on the, yeah. Bench, yeah, yeah. on the bench yeah always about to be Everton's next manager David Ancelotti <laughs> I do love that image though of Carlo just blowing the chalk off the queue after he's just wiped you out a bit like he was blowing on a cup of coffee after Everton go through against Spurs in the <laughs> FA Cup in extra time oh, yes. I mean just what an incredible human being Manchester City did have their chances Haaland hit the crossbar Didn't with a header. Yeah. Bernardo Silva need the rebound out of uh, bounds. Grealish had a breakaway shot deflected inches agonisingly wide. De Bruyne's rasping shots rasped slightly off. Don't know what it is with KDB tonight. Um, James, as a man with incredible locks yourself, I do swear the new volume of hair has almost reset his calibration. Um, he now takes <laughs> aim. He's still bloodless, but he's not adjusted the settings. Is that how hair works? I mean, the, the volume since he's been coming back from this, this injury that he, he picked up in last year's Champions League final, it's just remarkable. I, I, I don't know why his nutritionist is, is, you know, in terms of like, you know, someone said to me, if you drink a lot of Guinness, it's great for your hair um, because of the iron in there and that sort of thing, which I'm, I'm not drinking Guinness tonight. I'm, I'm on the Tuscan stuff. But who like, told, you, know who told mean, you that? Was it someone called Arthur Guinness? <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, let's see. The, yeah, the, the Premier League might be sponsored by Guinness one day, and you know, maybe then we'll know. But may, may, maybe when it when it is, if it is, yeah. Can you imagine the the hair. I'll still the be Premier drinking League. the Mickey Ultra. But at half time, Manchester City <laughs> dominated possession, sixty two percent, double the shots, yeah. ten to five, more than a hundred passes, and Real Madrid corner stood at eight to nil, uh, but they trailed in the only stat that mattered. Um, it was one nil on the night. Uh, 4-3 on aggregate. The City crowd actually booed at halftime. I'm not sure at what. Um, I think it was more the astonishment. It was like it was like hearing someone say to a police officer that they pulled them over, do you not know who we are, officer? I mean, second half started like the first. All City, Real Madrid, perfectly pleased to defend deep. Um, except for the times when Manchester City players bu uh, bullied uh, their goalkeeper loon in on any possible set piece. That was the story. 72nd minute, Doku came on. You know, his hunger kind of changed the game. His his intelligence, his mm. quick feet, the pace. Uh, it was his step over and cross. Antonio Rudiger, imperious up to that point, miscleared. Pass went straight to De Bruyne. Um, you could hear the swish of the ball hitting nothing but net through the TV screen, James. It was beautiful. 
It really was tight angle roof the net, just you know, magnificent uh, from, 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 from KDB. And, and, and to be honest, at that point, I thought, okay, there's a sense of inevitability about this game now. That you know, th- th- those it, it, it was like, yeah, I've, I've cited the ghosts that Real Madrid always seem to be able to summon. Yeah, they, 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 they summoned them up, and yet it, it felt like. It felt like KDB. I mean, he has got the locks to be in the new Ghostbusters, and like you know, sort of would just like what's the thing where you can add? What's the mach- the machine they have in Ghostbusters that kind of sucks the ghosts out? I think that's what happened. That's I, I thought that was going to happen. I love it. I put um, you on this show for your tactical analysis, and you never disappoint. <laughs> can I just tell you something quite embarrassing, James? You know, hmm. there's always hmm. a movie that you've never you, seen. You've never Ghostbusters. I can't believe I'm admitting this publicly. I don't know what yours is. I have never seen Ghostbusters, which is okay. which is <laughs> a, weakness, a human weakness. I'm not sure it's a human weakness. I mean, like ghosts, it keeps coming back. And like, you know, so I know, so but I can't is, catch. I can't just jump on now. I've got to go back. And I love Harold <laughs> Ramis. I really do. It's genuinely. But at this point, I feel like it's my thing. It's like a part of my personality to have not seen Ghostbusters. Yes. So I, 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 um, I, it's genuinely a deeply ingrained human flaw. To the game, though, not about me. Manchester City, they camped their defenders at a certain point. Akanji was there. Gavardiol in the Madrid box into extra time. Game honestly was like watching Manchester City give Real Madrid a full body cavity search in public. Real did flicker. Just before the half, the ball, though, fell to Rudiger. Right position, wrong guy, swung it wildly over. Um, second half of extra time was a, was a lot of Real Madrid, mighty Real Madrid, playing for, holding on for penalties. It was remarkable to see, by the way, City keep on running this late into the season. Cramp City. Um, I was exhausted just watching that second half. To penalties, Real Madrid keeper. I thought... Real Madrid were going to get blown away. Lunin looked far too much like Luca Dina uh, for me to actually be successful at the task of parrying City. Um, but my God, Julian Alvarez unleashed World Cup champion skills, lashing top right. Then Luka Modric. This was an amazing moment, which will be lost to history now. All 38 years of him. My God, he looked about 39 by the time he got to the spot. And we always know this man looks like a medieval peasant. This was a medieval peasant of a penalty. Just... I wouldn't say yeah. thrashing it, kind of like, yeah, he got those. Like, yeah. It's like watching Larry David take it. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> he, he just yeah, against Edison. Shock factor for you, Jimmy, one to ten. That was like, for me, it was like watching Beyonce just sing a hopelessly out of tune. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just to give you an impression of the discourse in Italy, okay, and the levels that you have. When, when Modric and De Bruyne were on the pitch, <laughs> they were saying that, this is perhaps the greatest rivalry that we've seen together. See these two men as if like Bernini and Borromini, two of the great architects <laughs> of the 17th and 18th century. You think of some of those great domes, those great churches, those great fountains in Rome. These guys were basically competing and that sort of thing. They're like Modric de Bruyne on the same, same pitch at the time. It's like walking into Piazza Navona in the 18th century and coming across these two guys having a knife fight. It's so good. So yeah, on on on. If we ex- if we were to extend this comparison, it'd be like seeing like I don't know Benini just like completely spoil a sculpture, <laughs> like you know, sort of like <laughs> completely just smudge oh, shit. smudge yeah. someone's face. <laughs> so yeah, that was that. that was, I was I was shocked until I saw Bernardo Silva's penalty. Which yeah, was, I was um, going to say. But by the way, equally as shocking for different reasons. This man is mm. Mister Consistency. Mr. Reliable, um, so technically proficient. Um, just like, I think one of the greatest bass players of all time went down the middle. Yeah. My God, Lunin had stood his ground and just shagged it calmly, uh, unemotionally, um, like a dad just shagging his kid's fly ball. Bellingham, my God, nerveless from the spot. He's been practicing from that moment since he was in the womb. Um, and then City sent up Kovacic. Did they not know, James? Did they not know tonight? Did they not get a memo about Croatians and penalties? <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Croatians great for taking you to extra time and making you sweat, not so much when it gets to penalties. <laughs> that's the thing. 
<laughs> Lucas yeah. Vasquez, Phil Foden traded clinical for clinical. Then Nacho did the same. Up came Edison, ruthless, like some kind of Brazilian Alyssa there with neck tats. Rudiger stepped up, though. Um, I mean, this was a man. I, mentally, I, I interviewed Cole, uh, Cole Palmer today, and I asked him what he thinks of when he's taking a penalty. Um, he said, nothing. Um, Rudiger's head. <laughs> Rudiger's a man who thinks about a lot of things. That was not a man thinking of nothing. James, as he went out, he was thinking about grudges. He was thinking about people who he owes finger in the eyes to, crafty, crafty little elbows, games that should have been won that slipped away. You know, great ten table tennis players, when you speak to them, they tell me that you they dream only of the losses. They never remember the victories. I feel like Rudiger is that kind of a man who just obsesses about... Um, uh, about the the, the 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 things that slipped away to watch him step up in that moment and smash home and reel off that was an incredible human accomplishment yeah i love unlikely penalty heroes like i mean if you look at madrid's last three penalty takers they're all defenders yeah lucas vasquez vasquez who's been playing as a right back nacho nacho man uh as well and then and then rudiger you know and rudiger a lot of young centre backs these days, they say, "Who do you look at?" And they're they're always just like, "Oh, we always we always go back and get the tapes of Rudiger defending against Haaland last year and that sort of thing." And and, and, and these these bootleg tapes on street corners in Western Europe, they go they go for a lot of money. Oh, God, <laughs> so, your arm off for so... a Rudiger bootleg baby. <laughs> Because um, that goal was narrative shattering. Um, you know, Manchester City's 4-0 beatdown in this game last season just mm. eviscerated in that moment. Suddenly we're talking about Real Madrid um, beating City for the third time um, in four seasons um, with ruthlessly ends justify the means pragmatism and wonder. Um, I mean, the narrative about Real Madrid, James, in this tournament is that they just find a way to know they will always find a way to win, always come back. They always find a way, right? Yeah, I mean, ever since you spoke about that full cavity search that they were, they were undergoing. <laughs> like the one you're going to get at the half. airport in about an hour's time. <laughs> exactly. All, I, all I've had in my mind of them is, is, is the rubber glove, but then Car- Carlo Ancelotti's eyebrow raised <laughs> By the way, that may be a both eyebrows for Carlo. That's one of the few things that makes both of them go up. <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, I, I know, I know from 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 you know, sort of uh, interviewed Carlo in the past and, um, and 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 seeing him interviewed that when he's been presented with this idea that he is one of Napoleon's lucky generals or he has got what Italians call culo, which literally means ass, but means luck. In Italian, you've got culo. Um, that he 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 doesn't always like that. He doesn't appreciate it because ultimately, you know, he's put a lot of work in uh, tactically. He's done a lot of kind of sort of uh, people skill management as well. But there is something about there is something that is so mystical about Carlo. Like like what 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 does this what what does this man understand about the Grail and that sort of thing? That yeah. It, that makes him just so, you know, I mean, when he was at Everton, Rog. Did that happen? Did, did that <laughs> happen, James? Or did I dream yeah. that? When James Rodriguez played for Everton. Did yeah, it happen? It's You're incredible. Right. Did it right. happen? I, I, I'm starting to doubt my own sanity. Did that really? He came on our show. They just won, <laughs> the, you know, the first five games, we were like, you know, storming in the table. Um and I just said to him, you know, you've got you've got Hammers, um, you know, you've got like a little tiny Bernard, whatever. I was like, it's like watching Khaleesi and her dragons. And he just leant into the microphone. He goes, Roger, yes, but winter is coming. That was his own. I was like, oh my god, he even does bits. He even does bits. He's amazing. <laughs> But I do need to know, where do you think tonight ranks for Ancelotti in his storied career? Is it equal first with that ecstatic managerial feat of leading Everton to victory over Liverpool at Anfield? What a man. Oof. It's a good question, actually. I mean, Carlo's got so many. That's what? the thing. Um, 
I think I think you know everyone remembers their first time, Rog, and um, two two thousand and three penalty shootout uh, against Juventus at Old Trafford. I think is is something that remains special to him. But also, like yeah, you know, the reason why I went back to that Everton spell, which just seems so incongruous uh, in this guy's in this guy's career, is that yeah, uh, the, 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 there's a tipping point with coaches where people say that guy's finished. You know, in, in Italian they say bolito. You know, he's he's cooked. That meat has been cooked all day. It's unappetizing. It's grey now. It's finished. Just chuck it out. Yeah. Uh, and it's been said about Jose Mourinho been said about it's been said about carlo and now jose every time he talks he goes i love carlo because <laughs> because carlo is, is 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 the way of saying no one's ever finished this this, this you, you can keep coming back you can keep like By the way, so it that, would have been, it would have been less it would have been less shameful for carlo to just spend a couple of months as an uber driver the manager everton football <laughs> club yeah he has rebounded from that Five star like, rating. Yeah, yeah. You know, I said, "What like, you like about Everton, Carlo?" He's like, "The beach is nice. It's a nice walk. My dog. It's nice." Oh my god! Uh, the statues was, on the beach. Yeah. That was his. That was his thing, wasn't it? He loved it. Yeah, he loved it. I mean, that was it. It was nothing to do with the football. I can't even believe it happened. But what a brutal night for the English coefficient. What a brutal mm. night for Manchester City. Our image of them is inevitable. Never mind invincible. An agony for Pep. Uh, the double treble now gone. Uh, probably has a massive swing in terms of their odds to lock down the Premier League title race. You know, the midweek football uh, now no longer cluttering the calendar. Bayern now face Real Madrid in the semi-final. We might have an all-German final, shades of 2013 all over again. Um, let's quickly turn our attention to last night's games. Just the 19 goals littered across those two ties that saw ah. the two clubs that finished ahead of AC Milan and Pulisic in the group stage. Yeah. Uh, they'll now play for the spot in the Champions League final. First up, Barcelona won, PSG 4. PSG win 6-4 on aggregate. How do you say? La remontada in French. It's probably something very similar. Romance language speakers, let us know in the chat. Just an incredible turnaround by PSG from 4-2 down on aggregate. 2-5-4. Barca opened the scoring here. Teenage sensation, Lamina Mal. Dropped to shoulder, burn up the PSG bat line, set up Rafina. 16 years, 278 days. Youngest player ever to record an assist in the knockout round of the Champions League. I actually have t-shirts, many of them, that are older than Lamine Yamel. Um, but this was all misdirection. Luis Enrique set his team up to control the game. Um, and PSG displayed real tenacity. 29th minute, Barola brought down by Aroha. Red card, baby. 10 minutes later... Um, Ex-Barcelona, flickeringly electric, Dembélé swooped in at the back post from an acute angle, slapped the ball like Elvis Costello. His aim was true. Lil Selly against his old team, but he ran it right back. The ball to the centre circle. Two goals against his former lovers in this tie. Then won a penalty, and Mbappe converted. Barca valiantly tried to push forward with 10 men, and Mbappe finished them off for a night of nights. Barcelona, what a dark narrative this season. has been eight points back in La Liga. Xavi leaving. Now this, just a buckling fold at home, um, which left the club out of next summer's Club World Cup. Some players in tears at the final whistle. Magical night from Mbappe, the Madrid media. Loved him crushing Barcelona souls. Headlines in the Spanish papers, Mbappe kills Barca. And Marca had Mbappe eats Barca, which I love. Just an enormous win. James, this is a very different PSG side, though, than, than the one in our imaginations. This is this is a team full of younger, rawer talents rather than ego-filled coach-killing megastars of recent York. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned Bacola, who, like, you know, I always think of when you, you read his name phonetically, it's it's like Bacola, you know, it's it's like Bobby Bacola from, uh, from The Sopranos. And, like, he was this kind of fumbling player in the group stages where you know, I remember against Dortmund in particular, missed loads of chances. So to see this kid, you know, sort of essentially have a tie defining moment for, for PSG in getting it out of sent off was kind of magnificent. Also Dembele, Dembele sold by Barca. You know, he was the guy that they basically blew a load of uh, Neymar money on uh, and, and, and spent their way into oblivion. And now this guy comes back and like you know, sort of wins a penalty, scored a goal in the first the first leg, 
And it's just like, oh God, Jesus. I mean, that is like a, if that's, that's a slap in the face with a, a sea bass, I don't know. Um, Death by narrative, James, honestly. Death by of, narrative. A lot of people want to go, a lot of people want to go in their sleep. Give me death by narrative any day of the week. Dortmund uh, 4. And, Go on. And Rog, you mentioned those marker ass headlines saying, you know, Mbappe kills Barca. <laughs> I mean, Mbappe wearing white as well. The Madrid white in Barcelona. And not even playing well, kind of like Madrid do, and yet still being, <laughs> still doing enough to win this game and send PSG through. So, um, oh, yeah. You'll be, you know. you'll be fantastic playing grim, pragmatic, Hold Manchester City at arm's length football next uh, next season for Real Madrid. I can't <laughs> wait to watch it, Killian. Dortmund four, Atletico two. Dortmund win five for an aggregate. Delirious night in Dortmund as the Germans full crugged their way uh, to the semi final. Former Manchester United loanee and really handsome ha- uh, hair devil Marcel Sabitzer so producing really a masterclass to unhinge Atletico. Um, God. Diego Simeone, you think of him, you think defensive ferocity, tenacity, a war to the very last available bayonet. This is not that side. A couple of years of underinvestment have left them really hollowed out, aged out at the back. Atletico and their pomp would never have allowed two goals in five minutes that turned the tie on its head. Most certainly the final goal, simple diagonal ball, two Dorman players, Julian Brandt and that old school battering ram, Nicholas Fulcrug, gifted time and space to finish. Reminded us as Dorman advanced, despite looking dismally outmatched, slapstickly brittle in the opening leg, that football, this whole bloody quarterfinal, football always makes a fool out of us. GFOP at BRI Erie tweeted, the Roger Bennett full-page retraction on Dortmund is going to be juicier than an Access Hollywood Trump recording. I just say, mere culpa at BRI Erie, you deserve it. James, Dortmund PSG semi-final, fascinating clash. Dormund, hilariously entertaining to watch. Uh, so wondrously flawed. Uh, so a PSG, but they do have the ability to punish erratic backlines. Um, one thing we do know is a non-Super League team is going to be in the Champions League final. What else do you predict about this matchup? Well, and a, a non-Champions League winning coach as well, because Edin Terzic is the only guy in this, uh, in this club of their final four who's basically gate-crashed it. You know, it's sort of like, you know, he's he, he's got through the kind of red velvet uh, rope, uh, wearing sort of ripped jeans, um, you know, beer spilled all over his T-shirt, whilst you've got Luis Enrique, Tommy Tuchel and Carlo Ancelotti there. Do you really um, think you know, Tuchel's I've... a Tommy? Do you think anyone calls Tuchel <laughs> Tommy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. But again, this is from spending too much time in Italy where they, they, they love saying like, Frank Lampard was never Frank Lampard to Italians. They just had to make him Frankie. And so he... <laughs> I don't know whether it's a Frankie goes to Hollywood thing, but like, it was like, eh, Frankie goal. Frankie Lampard. I fatto un altro goal. It was like, okay, Frankie Lampard. That's okay. amazing. So, yeah. he's, just, he's just like, he is the kind of guy that if you did call him Tommy, no matter how free, he'd stop you coldly, chilly, and be like, Thomas. It's Thomas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's not Tommy. Right. There's no Tommy. No Tommy here. <laughs> Go on, but finish your point. Yeah. Tell me two cool. no, so, so, on the one hand, you know, I remember remember when Dortmund went through that phase where people all of a sudden discovered Dortmund. And yeah, they were like, Yergi, oh. and the Yergi. That's what you yeah. call him. Yeah, and it was like, oh my God, this, this, is, this, is, this is great. They've got the killer bees, um, you know, sort of swarming over like a, an ice cream which has fallen on the pavement. That was gegenpressing pressing <laughs> back in 2011. Um, and then, and then it's like, wow, they've, they've, they've got to a Champions League final. Even though they'd done this in 1997 and they'd actually won the thing, um, but it was like, and they, they've got this this big wall and it's yellow, and you know what? It's cheaper to fly from Luton to Dortmund and go get a Dortmund ticket than it is to go and watch Arsenal. We should all become Dortmund fans. <laughs> so there was this kind of like this plucky Dortmund thing, even though they play in the biggest stadium in Europe, um, <laughs> even though they had Robert Lewandowski, and, uh, and and yeah, it feels again that this is like, oh yeah, look at the, 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 if there's a romantic story to be told, still, 
in uh, in the Champions League. It is Dortmund, you know. Uh, you, made sound like, you made this sound like German Rex said, "We've not up und Um can, can we can we look <laughs> ahead um, very quickly to the two good games mm. tomorrow? I just want to get bits on these, and then I want to jump to a couple of callers who've been amazing. I could speak to you all night. James Horncastle, you beautiful human being. Do you, to, do you want to come on my Ryanair flight? Yeah, we just, you, at a certain point, you're going to hop into your car and we're going to carry this on in your car service to wherever, the, whichever airport you're flying from. But we do need to talk about Atalanta very quickly. You know their remarkable ground, the Gwis Stadium. Um, 3-0 down, Liverpool gobsmacked. Um, having to face again up to coach Gasparini. I don't understand why. I said this to Rory Smith earlier in the week. Why? He does not get his name banded around bigger clubs in Europe. They should be salivating over this man. That's not a question for now. But do Liverpool stand any chance, any chance of a of a burger missed out ball? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've got the firepower. I mean, even in the Palace game, I mean, their, their XG, to use, you know, sort of number wang advanced metrics, uh, was, was ridiculously high. Um, and so they are creating chances. They're just not taking them. And, you know, I think they have good players and good players over time will take those chances. The, the only the only issue that I think with this this narrative of a uh, burger miss Istanbul, as you said, I can't believe I've been able to say that at five to midnight on uh, but, but, but uh, is that Atlanta will score goals too. And, you know, I, I saw Liverpool fans sort of clutching on Monday night to A, Atalanta playing on Monday night. People are like, they're playing on Thursday. What are they playing on Monday night for? This is mad. Um, and they were 2 0 up against Hellas Verona. And then they drew 2 2. And they were like, ah, oh, well, you see, if they, they give up goals like that against uh, against Liverpool, then, then it's over. But you know, they were 2 0 up. Scored a beautiful goal from uh, Gianluca Scamacca. And the thing is, Hellas Verona, for much of that game, played like Bayern did against Arsenal. And like, they sat back, no space, and basically hit them on the counter-attack and then grew in a bit of grew in confidence. Liverpool give you so much space. Liverpool are a team that come on to you. Um, they're, not going, they're not going to be... I'm not going to say they're not going to be humble, but they are going to be a team that um, wants to play and take the initiative. And that will give Atalanta space and they will score goals, I'm sure of it. We also need to touch upon AC Milan, or else I might get my citizenship revoked. Christian politics Milan, as they're known around the world. One nil down from a very flaccid first leg performance. Manager Pioli perpetually in the firing line this season. Game still very much up for grabs. Can we? Should we Americans dare to dream? Or are Milan going to crap the bed? Break our hearts, James, ahead of the Milan derby that could see actually into crown champions. AC Milan Roma, just give us a tiny burst and then we'll take some questions. Well, who do you choose, Rog, like on, on, in Team America here? Do you go with the Texan Toyota salesman who owns Roma? Or, or, or do you go with, with Pulisic and Yunus Musa, you know, and, and, and Jerry, um, you know, sort of Gorgon Gecko? You know, I mean, this is this is this is the thing. I, Jerry I think... Cardinale, Gordon Gecko, that's amazing. <laughs> and I think with with Milan, this is so big for them because their, their season comes down to this. They're going to get Champions League. They're going to finish second easily. Okay. And, and Pioli was even a little bit spiky today because uh, he was he flared up at one of the comments made by Daniel De Rossi. He said kind of like, at least we'll be in the Champions League next year. Uh, where there's still some doubt with Roma. But the, the problem is if, if Milan get knocked out on Thursday night, on Monday they play the Milan derby and they're the home side. And if Inter win that game, Inter win the league for the 20th time, which in Italy is a big thing because if you win, this, if you win the league 10 times and then 10 times again, you get to have a nice little star over your badge. And that, mean, that means a hell of a lot in Italy. So they will get... Not only to win the league against Milan, their biggest rivals, but also to get the star. So 19 to 20 league titles. Milan, incidentally, at this moment, are on 19 as well. So, like, it would be heavy. It would be bad God. for Milan to have this week where go out in the cup and then, and then, and then succumb and give up the title to Inter in this. It's, 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 it would be the worst nightmare. 
for me, I love, the least. I, I love this little star idea. Um, and I'm mm. thinking if you get over 10 points deducted in a season, you should be able to put a little turd emoji over your badge, which would be a nice <laughs> gift for Everton fans. I'm not going to talk about uh, Chelsea 6, Everton 0. I'll save that for Friday's podcast. I'm not going to talk about yeah. Leeds, although I do want to hear your take on your team and the championship race. I do want to get to questions very quickly before we end, because you've been so patient, you beautiful GFOPs, as I've lost myself in Horncastle, which is the name of a very romantic novel, which I'm going to forthcome out on Harlequin Press. A reminder how this works here on YT Live. You just have to scan that QR code, top left of your screen, click on the pin, comment in the chat, take you into a Zoom with our producer, J-Dubs, will tell you everything you need to know. Don't worry, you won't appear on screen. We've got a couple lined up. I do want to take them because you've been amazing. First up, it's the great Amanda Bernal. Come on up. Tell us where you are and what's your question for the mighty Jimmy Horncastle? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm calling from Santa Rosa, California, so up north. And Gorgeous. this is actually my first do it live that I've ever yeah. joined. So well, you'll I'm never come back, excited. Amanda. So just go go <laughs> full bore. Get in here. Tell us. Tell us what your yes. question is. It's great to so, have you. Thank you. Um, I was watching Man City play Real Madrid and my heart broke when it went into penalty kicks. Um, and I just wanted to ask both of you, like, what was missing? Like, what was the secret sauce that they didn't have? They had so many shots on target. They were dominating the entire game. What what didn't click today um, from both of you? James Horncastle, you beautiful human being. <laughs> World does not need more Rodge. <laughs> I, I'm not going to give Amanda the the, the history answer because that's just a cop out. I think even though we spent the first 20 minutes of this, <laughs> this conversation talking are you about going, this, are you going book of the dead? Does that mean <laughs> book of the dead? No, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna say a centre back uh, stepping up because Pep Amanda has spent the last like year. He, he, he went through like um, 10 years of his career where he wanted to just play midfield players in every position. He wanted a midfield player in goal. He wanted a midfield player as a striker. Now he just plays four defenders, four centre-backs. I think he wants a team of centre-backs. Even in the first leg, he had this whole thing where he would have uh, Jack Grealish pin Danny Carvajal, the Real Madrid right-back. So one of their centre-backs could get forward and that's where Guardiola scored his goal. I think if he could have like five penalty takers of centre backs, then you know he would be very much happy with that, and that will be his request in their transfer strategy meetings. I want a team full of centre backs. Enough of this Haaland guy, basta. So yeah, there you I, go. I, I, I will say, Amanda, um, I've just looked up the Book of the Dead, by the way, and the first quote that came up is, "I live again and again after death, like raw day to day," which is Arsenal fans, you'll relate to that feeling. Living again after death, like raw day to day. Um, but ultimately, I think the agony, I do think about the agony for Pep in this moment, um, is probably that it went to penalties. Like This is a man who adores control. The penalty shootout is the opposite of control. You can't even train for that moment. It's a, it's a, it's a device that, you know, this is a man that talks about the collective, thinks about the machine. It turns it into an individual game. Um, I imagine Pep will probably have his players actually play Russian roulette in training um, on on Tuesday, both as a mechanism to improve their penalty taking, their nerve <laughs> under intense pressure, um, and also as a punishment. Um, you first, Jack Grealish, he'll say, uh, handing him the the, in, in, the scene in like the deer hunter. Amanda, are you a City fan? Am I relishing too much your your team's pain because I, I won't apologize if that is the case and if you are a city fan, i am a city you, fan do yes. you feel pain in this movie I'm, I'm fascinated can one so used to winning one so you know you've seen so many joys you've experienced so many nights uh you've eaten so much chocolate almost like augustus gloop in in willy wonka you've eaten, you've drunk them from the chocolate river is it it, it does this hurt tonight amanda i don't mean to be taking pleasure it, from your pain but i am fascinated as an everton fan no definitely it hurts a little and it's also just a reminder of like the beauty of soccer and the roller coaster of emotions like and there's still the premier league title that's um something to look forward to so it's a little setback but also it's all going to be okay oh you know i'm gonna give you this 
from the Book of the Dead, which is the theme of the night. This is for you, Amanda Bunnell. Life is but a fleeting moment. Death is eternal. I've got to say, I don't know what that means, but as an Everton fan, I feel exhilarated. <laughs> Come be with us anytime, Amanda Bunnell. It's time for Christina Stotts. Remind us where you are and what's your question. I'm going to take one more after you. Oh, and then we're going to we're going to close this baby down so that our man Horncastle can get on this plane. Christina, come on up. Tell us where you are and what's your question. Good evening, Raj and James. This is Christina Saz from Joplin. And my question is for James. So I've heard Rory Smith and I've also heard you talk about Gasparini and being possibly connected with jobs in England. Would, would Gasparini be interested in going to England, first of all? Second of all, what would his buyout clause be with Atalanta? Should he leave Atalanta to go to a job in the Premier League or possibly somewhere else? That's a great question, Christina Stotts. Let's start a GoFundMe, Everton fans, and hit this buyout clause. What is it, James? I think you need a GoFundMe to pay off these loans and like sort of do a takeover. Loan schmoes. We... <laughs> so, Christina, great question. I think uh, Gasparini, I mean, he's a 66-year-old man now. And, you know, I, I think over the course of a long coaching career, he is very much... He knows that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. You know, for example, like in 2011, he got his first big job, which was to go and coach Inter, one of the biggest clubs in Italy. And he got chewed up and spat out within like six weeks. Zero wins. Because right? Zero wins because star players didn't want to change for him. And he recognizes maybe I should have changed for them. And that's always kind of burnt him. And so, you know, at Atalanta, he's got a club that is a little bit, I mean, this is completely different dimensions, but relatively speaking, it's a little bit like what Pep has at Man City, right? In that, that club has been built for Pep, in that before, that before they appointed Pep Guardiola, they got all chief executives who'd worked with Pep, who were going to basically buy players that would appeal to Pep and, and just let him be Pep. And that's what Gaspar that's what Atlanta have done for Gasparini. And I, I think he appreciates um, what they've done for him. He's been successful. He's been there for eight years now. He's got the keys to the city of Bergamo. So, you know, I mean, he can he can do whatever he likes in Bergamo. I think, you know, like if anyone makes olive oil in Bergamo, wine in Bergamo, they have to send it to Gasparini. He's got the he's got the keys to the city. So it's it, it becomes difficult for, for, for him to leave. Um, I think does he, does, he speaking, just, does he speak English? Is it good? Is he just no, not he, good he at speaks, PowerPoints? Is that why he never got a Premier League job? <laughs> he speaks uh, Piedmontese, which is uh, the local dialect from where he's from, Piedmont in north north of Italy. Speaks Italian, obviously, but um, I think it's a big ask for him now at sixty six to to learn English. It's not necessarily a, a, a hurdle to to stop him going to to a Premier League club. But I think the, the reason maybe why he's not in these conversations isn't because clubs don't see the brilliance and the fact that he's overachieved and he does so much with such a small budget. It's, it's just that that guy knows he's onto a good thing at Atalanta. He's 66 and we need to be looking at the guys that played under him and are doing well in City out there, well, in Italy at the moment. Um, which is kind of, I think, always a good. The mark of a great coach is the the coaches that they in turn mentor, players who played for them, who reach the end of their playing career, and then go on and coach. And if you look at like a quarter of the coaches in the top flight in Italy at the moment, they all played under him, and they all play his style of play. So, you know, I think if you're a, a Premier League team or a good Spanish team or something like that, you're probably looking at one of the guys who played for him, who's coaching and doing well in Italy at the moment, rather than going for him. God bless. That's a great question, Christina. Starts. I love the idea of the Gasparini tax. Sean Dyche will just have it all paid out in local lagers and and and, and, and semi-fresh pies. Oh, 
finishing off the night it is oh i feel your pain it's welcome back to the great joshua youngerman remind us where you're from and how you're holding up you beautiful human being uh i'm in new york I, look man this was a weird 24 hours because i'm a dortmund fan in the bundesliga so and that's exactly how i discovered dortmund dortmund is i couldn't afford arsenal tickets in london so i hopped uh, on a flight from luton and went to dortmund <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> amazing. Fantastic. Well, actually, like, I, 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 I played uh, as them on FIFA a lot. And uh, my buddy who's English, who I went to school with in England, he was a huge Dortmund fan, so he helped get me into them. So give him a it was exciting. Out, and then give, a, give, him a, give him a shout oh, out. My buddy, my buddy Elliot, who, when he was over here in the States, he and I played as Everton, total football, and won the Champions League in FIFA. So did that happen? Are possible, did, that, did that happen? Did that happen, Josh? That to yes. me feels as real as Ancelotti being Everton's bloody manager, Joshua <laughs> Younger. I, I take as much pride from your bloody FIFA victory as I do from those days. We are long in this show, Joshua Youngerman. So let us oh, hear yeah. your question, Please. and you Keep are going to do this guess. outfit. Okay. So my question is this: What the the sort of difference? And I know they had a bad second half against. Aston Villa, but I, I, you know, overall in the past month, you know, 2024, the Arsenal have been amazing in the Premier League. Why is it just experience that they lack in the Champions League? Um, or are they missing, a, you know, I mean, people talk about a striker, but what are they missing to sort of correlate what they're doing in the Premier League to the Champions League? Or is it just something that they're going to have to fail a bunch of times in order to eventually succeed at? It's very zen. You have to fail a bunch of times, James Horn Castle, before you can succeed. I mean, it's essentially the plot of the Karate Kid, isn't it? That you're looking at. How do you explain this? Because, I mean, there was also the theory that English teams are beating the crap out of each other with heavy armor week in, week out. Um, so when it comes to these clashes, the the other teams have a you know a freshness, a zest, um, an ability to peak. Um, just when Arsenal are, are troughing, another great line from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, duration of life is eternity, which is how really the Manchester City game felt. But how would you answer the question from your uniquely global perspective, James Horn? <laughs> okay, so I would say that, um, you know, I've seen a lot of people talk on social media in the last hour about, oh, Arsenal's budget, their resources. Um, and... Listen, I think their budget and their resources, while they are a Premier League club, strangely smaller than particularly the teams that are still in the Champions League with the exception of, of Borussia Dortmund, okay? So I think that's a factor. However, I do always have a little sympathy for Premier League teams when Premier League teams make every year, you know, four or five billion and the rest of Europe makes half of that. So... That money allows you to have deeper squads and you should be better in Europe, better equipped to go deeper in Europe. I also think like this, this narrative that Rog just alluded to in terms of like Premier League teams beating the crap out of each other. It's, it's often something that Premier League teams cling to, um, went to explain why it's gone wrong in Europe when it actually made Barcelona and Real Madrid incredible in the Champions League at the early part of the last decade. I think that, that, that time when Madrid then went on and started winning three Champions Leagues under Zidane after beat with, with Ancelotti is entirely explicable from being battle-hardened of playing against Pep's Barcelona and against Tito Villanova's Barcelona and that sort of thing. That's one so team, it, with... James. That's one team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was so intense. Right? <laughs> um, so anyway, but to come back to Arsenal, to circle back to Arsenal, I would say that do not underestimate how uh, one game or, or one half of football in which you make more mistakes than you have in two and a half months um, comes back to haunt you and is enough to put you out. And I, I think it's not necessarily a case of what are Arsenal missing. It's just, it, it can be one of those nights, which was a week ago when you have defensive mistakes that Arsenal just don't make. When you have Ben White, uh, 1v1 with Manuel Neuer, and and he hits it too well, as we say over in England. He's hit that too well, straight at him. 
Uh, and that's the difference because I think if, if, if Arsenal go one 0 up in that game, well, if, if, if Ben White scores that goal, it's it's different, you know. It's, sliding um, doors, baby. It's it sliding is. doors. I'll just tell you, Josh Youngerman. I, I still don't understand this. I do know the very first time I interviewed Pep Guardiola. Um, you know, it's this end of near the end of his first season at Manchester City when he was struggling to adapt to the Premier League. I don't teach the tackles, that kind of thing. Um, and he just kept screaming at me during the interview. And because he screamed at me, it's something I always remember. He kept just saying, "Because we don't have the history, that we don't win." Uh, like it was just such a to me at the moment, it was crazy. Barcelona have the history. Uh, Real Madrid have the history. Um, Manchester City took time to have that history. Uh, tonight is a night of pain for Manchester City fans. Um, pain-ish, come on, you're doing fine. Um, do, you think, do you think, so you're saying that Arsenal just need to commission I, more historians? More historians. More, more, <laughs> more Jonathan Wilson. They should be playing what? Doris Kearns. They should be, yes, they should be playing more writers of non great non-fiction volumes. Um, they they need they need need like um, more Tom Holland. They need um, they they more do Anthony, the, Anthony Beaver, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, Ch Churchill's ten volume uh, history of uh, of the empire. They need to play yeah. that set of dusty volumes. I don't understand it, but it in the Champions League it matters. Um, it means something. It um, it carries huge weight just like Everton have a proud history of points deductions you are who you are I think is ultimately what we're saying James you are the world's most gorgeous man before we go a look at everything else coming from the Men and Blades World Headquarters this week all of it brought to you by James has just finished his uh, his Tuscan stuff which means it's the end of the show brought to you by Michelob Ultra superior light beer which we both agree on tonight we want to give a shout to our American States United newsletter roundup of all the news from our men and women playing abroad in a simple seven minute read. This week's issue is about oh, the best player in the world, Gio Reyna. Current situation in Nottingham Forest. I am actually going to take my kids to watch Gio Reyna take a massive dump on Everton uh, <laughs> before our live eyes. And I'm going to hate and love every second. It's written by our editor in chief, the great Randy Kim. Sign up on menandblazers.com. Uh, we've got a huge amount. Sign up for the Raven that comes out on Friday, the Women's Game Newsletter too. Um, we've also got some beautiful, the Brighton and Hove Albion CEO, Paul Barber. I think that one's coming out, is it Tuesday? Uh, we've got the great Humphrey Carr from Wrexham, reliving the joyous scenes uh, from North Wales, coming out, I believe, on Monday. A huge amount of stuff which I hope brings you joy. Nothing has brought me more joy. Um than being with you, James Horncastle. You're a remarkable human being. You're honestly adore listening to you. your your zest for life, your willingness to not humiliate me, uh, to to Ghostbusters shame me is probably one of the greatest human characters. Yeah, my zest for life, having spoken about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, <laughs> but so I advise all of you, all of our. All of, our, all of our people who were on the hippie trail in the 1960s, if you want to dust off that book and read it again, let's, go for it. Let's, let's do this again when you're back from Birmingham. Eh? We'll just do a little book club. I'll be back Friday with a brand new episode of WGFOP. Call in your questions, 646-450-9472. Oh, James Horncastle, travel safely, you beautiful man. How long are you in Italy? Uh, until Monday. Godspeed. Yeah. Enjoy no, until Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> no. it doesn't matter it's all a blur now no, no. you're an amazing man Scratchy. thank you you beautiful gotcha. human being courage <laughs>